Well, guys, three episodes in, and we are reminded that this is, in fact, a Damon Lindelof show with easily Watchmen's strongest episode yet. Don't change the channel. Don't touch that dial. We got it all on you and Take out the speakers. Hey, guys, it's Kevin in my review for Watchmen Season 1, Episode 3. She was killed by Space Junk, and holy shit, uh, what an episode this was. I mean... Look, I've really been loving this show. I know a lot of people have been very hesitant because, oh, it hasn't felt like Watchmen and things like that, and it's, it's kind of done its own thing. This episode was the complete opposite. This was Watchmen to a T. We're really starting to get a better idea of, like, where this season is headed, where the show is headed, and I am definitely all for it where we are going here. This was a much different episode, though, than the first two. It very much was reminiscent of of the kind of stuff that Lindelof used to do back in the Leftovers days, you know, when he used to have single character focused episodes, uh, because this episode, it doesn't focus on Angela, it focuses on the character of, um, Lori Blake, a character that we do know from the original, you know, Watchmen, uh, iconography and things like that, like, we know her very well from the graphic novel, but this episode gives us a far more intimate and just very, um, again, a, a very good look at the kind of person that she is now and what she's really been doing. And yes, this is a character that we did already know, but I think this episode made her an even better character than she already was. Because I do have to say, out of all of the characters in Watchmen, uh, she was my least, she was the one I was least interested in. I thought that she was good, um, but I just didn't think that she was one of the strongest. This episode very much makes her one, and I love where they're going. And I'll just say right off the bat, Jean Smart is completely owning this role. She is chewing up all the scenery. She's so charismatic. She's so great in this role, and she's so perfectly cast her. I've always loved Jean Smart since Fargo Season 2. That's when I really started to recognize her more, but this is easily some of the best work I've ever seen from her. She's just perfectly capturing someone like Lori Blake, someone who once had a ton of optimism um, and once had this knack for, you know, being a superhero and things like that. But she's since done her own thing. She's very much grown up since then. She's become a lot more cynical, and she's just tired with the way the world has gone. And I thought overall she just did such an incredible job throughout this entire episode, and definitely one of the best things about it. And now we're at a point where, you know, while Regina King has been the standout for the past two episodes, I can honestly see Jean Smart rivaling her here, because I think she did some excellent work throughout this show. But let's get more into the kind of person that Lori Blake was, because like I said, most of this episode is very much focused on her, and we get a very good look into who she, what she's really been up to since then. She has become this uh, police chief of sorts, and I love the way we're introduced to her, just right off the bat, uh, that whole heist scene, you think, oh, maybe she's, you know, uh, still vigilante or something like that, but you realize that it was all just a setup so she could bring um, hooded justice to, well, justice, basically. Basically, and I thought that was just a really great moment, and her lack of care that he was a superhero, um, I thought was hilarious. It's stuff like that. I mean, the comedy was so on point in this episode, and I really loved what they ended up doing there. But basically, she is very quickly assigned the case of Judd Crawford. She's going to try to figure out, you know, um, who ended up killing him as well as what could have possibly, um, you know, led to this event, who was behind it, all that kind of stuff, and, uh, she uses this to her advantage. She uses this to really get to know a lot of these characters very well, and we see very early on that Lori is very much the smartest one in the room. I mean, she doesn't buy anyone's bullshit, Angela's bullshit, uh, you know, Looking Glass or Wade's bullshit. She sees through it all, and it's mainly because she herself has been a vigilante. She She's done this before, so she really isn't, um, you know, there's there's really nothing that these characters can hide from her, and I really love this idea that she's going to be on their tail, especially when it comes to Angela, who you think at first she's going to try to help her out and things like that, but you see that she really is starting to get more information about the kind of person that Angela was, and... 
she hates the fact that there are so many lawmen that are, you know, ruling the town, and she really wants to change that, because nobody really takes vigilante seriously anymore, whether it's the scene where she's first assigned to the case, and she brings up, you know, uh, Rorschach's manifesto, and the guy basically says something to the effect of, uh, well, it's the nine, it's not the 1980s, nobody cares about Rorschach anymore. You can see how this has very much hurt her. This has had a very visceral effect on her, and even though Lori is someone who tried to get away from the superhero life. You can see that she was pulled right back in, going as far as to take her father's name, which is honestly pretty hilarious, considering that the whole story was that she didn't want to be groomed by her mother, she didn't want to be Silk Spectre. No, she wanted to become, like, the comedian, basically. That's the kind, that's more of what she wanted to do, and, uh, Again, we don't know, we, we know enough to where I think that they did a really good job with setting up this character. Yeah, we didn't get flashbacks or anything, but I don't really think we needed them. We see through, you know, uh, her mannerisms and the way she carries herself, what she's really been through. We get intel on Night Owl that he has clearly been arrested, and uh, this is something that has very much affected her. And we also get to see a lot more of Senator Keen in this episode, and how he really seems like he's going down a villainous path. He is dead set on becoming president. He wants to finally, you know, um, you know, he, he wants to finally get uh, President Redford off. You know, he wants to do what he can to end his reign once and for all, because we know President Redford's been the longest president, um, in, in, at least in the show, he's been the longest president um, in history, and so he wants to be the one that finally puts a stop to that, and he promises her that, like, you know, if I give you this pardon, you know, we're gonna free, um, you know, we're, we're gonna free Night Owl and all that kind of stuff, and Lori isn't buying it. She doesn't really buy the fact that this is true. She thinks that he's just doing this to curry favor, and I think that's very much the case. I don't think Keen really cares about any of this stuff. I think mean, he's just doing this for his own self-interest. You know, he has this desire to become a politician and to be president, and I don't think it's headed in a good direction. And James Wolk is doing a really good job at portraying someone that would be in Keane's position. He's very approachable, he's very charming, but you can tell that there's definitely some deceit there. You can tell that there's definitely some kind of other angle that he's just not, you know, he's just not saying at the moment. And Laurie can tell that there's, she's definitely sensing that there's something off about him, and I'm excited to see where that goes for sure. But getting into the Dr. Manhattan stuff, that's easily the best thing about Lori's arc here, just showing how alone she really is. And that's what makes this character so great in this episode. It's not just her delivery. It's not just how she is the smartest person in the room and things like that. She really is alone. She has no one at this point. Nobody takes, nobody is really caring about her past. Nobody really cares about what she did as a vigilante. Just nobody really seems to, to care about her all that much. And the only person that she really does feel like she has a connection to is Dr. Manhattan, but the problem is these two have been away for so long, you kind of wonder, does he even really hear her? Does he even care about this joke that she's going on about? Which, getting into that joke, there's a lot of things that she brings up here. A lot of interesting sort of, um, you know, a, lo a lot of interesting, I think, sort of allegories on, you know, what she's really talking about, and definitely a lot of things to dissect, but I think really what this joke was supposed to be about is that in every single one of them, she talks about, you know, a character from the original graphic novel. She starts off talking about Night Owl and things like that, and how even though Night Owl never killed anyone, he was sent to prison for not being tough enough, and then, you know, she goes on about Ozymandias, who we'll get more into him in a little bit, um, and how even though, you know, he killed three million people and things like that, but even though he saved humanity in that way, they still sent him to hell. Um, and then, of course, finally going to Dr. Manhattan, and in every single one of these jokes, she talks about how these vigilantes are very much blamed for what happened, and that even though, yes, they have done heroic things, Nobody is really giving them the credit. They have been completely outlawed, and 
that is why she doesn't feel what Keen is saying is is gen is you know genuine in any way because his father was in fact responsible for the um complete you know he he was responsible for outlawing vigilantes and you can see how this has really gone to her and how she really does care about Dr. Manhattan she really hopes they still do have some kind of a connection there but you kind of wonder if that even is really a thing if that even is something that is in fact valid and I feel like the end of the episode is kind of a sign that maybe he did notice what she was talking about and that's maybe where that laughing is coming from but again we don't know a ton about what's really going on there but I do I am kind of inclined to believe that what we saw fall out of the sky at the end of this episode is the same thing that we saw that dragged Will, you know, um, into space. I think that's kind of what's going on there. I think Dr. Manhattan definitely has something brewing, and I'm excited to see where that really does go. I don't know if that device that we see in this episode, you know, the, the hourglass, I don't know if that has any connection to um, Dr. Manhattan, but either way, we got a lot of things in, we, you know, we got a lot of information... <clears throat> But the other big plot point in this episode involves the character of Petey, who I fucking love. This is really the only person that shows any respect towards Lori. He is, in fact, a fan of the original Watchmen. You know, not not the original Watchmen from, like, the 40s, but, like, the Watchmen that she was a part of. And she he knows that she's Silk Spectre, and he also knows that Adrian Veidt is, in fact, Osmandius. He knows all this stuff, and he doesn't want to be treated that way, though, because, again, he knows that most people don't care, and she doesn't want, uh, you know, he doesn't want her to treat him like a fan, and you think at first that she's just annoyed by him, doesn't really care, and all that stuff, but we see that I think that there's definitely some care there for sure. I think these two are definitely going to start to care more for each other. I think he's definitely going to be there for her in a way that someone like Dr. Manhattan can't, and I'm excited to see where that really does go for sure, and I think Pete as a character is again going to add another level to uh, Laurie that we just haven't seen before and I'm excited to see where they end up going with him. But either way, we still got a lot of information with Lori here. We saw why she can be, why she could potentially be the best character of this entire show, between Gene Smart's great performance and things like that, but also just how much she is already clashing with Angela. I mean, their scene together is just so great because every single thing that Lori is saying is stuff that Angela already knows, but because of the fact that Angela has to be coy about it, um, you know, that's why she's not saying anything. That's why she's not responding. She doesn't want people to know of, you know, what Crawford was really doing and how he might have had more of a connection to the 7th Calvary than, um, you know, uh, than Lori might have known about. But, again, I do think that Lori is going to find out about this very soon because, again, she clearly has an inkling of what's really going on here. And I'm excited to see where that all really does go. But all of this stuff was so great. I think we they did a really great job of diving deeper into this character. I can't wait to see where she ends up going from now on. And uh, definitely one of the most promising things of this entire show so far. I loved everything they did with Blake in this episode. However, the other major element to talk about in this episode is that we finally get confirmation that the Lord of County Manor is, in fact, Adrian Veidt. And look, I'm obviously I knew because of episode, because of, you know, Jeremy Irons uh, revealing that, uh, you know, uh, basically accidentally revealing that uh, too soon and things like that. Um, but I'm just happy that they confirmed it because I don't have to be upset that they, they haven't done that yet. They very much do confirm it here, but we also get a good idea of what's actually going on in this storyline, because basically, everyone thinks that Ozymandias was dead, they think that they, basically, he was sentenced to death, but in reality, he has gone plastic surgery, and he's now living off the grid, isolated from everyone else, and nobody has heard or seen from him in years, but you can tell that Lori is already sensing that he is still very much out there, and that is very much the case, and we don't know what he's planning, but he still has his costume, he's still referring to himself as Adrian Veidt, and I definitely think that there is a lot more going on here, but you also see that he is really starting to become stir-crazy, because of what he's dealing with. I mean, he's just getting tired of Miss Crushanks and Mr. Phillips, them constantly singing him happy birthday and things like that. 
And I don't, so I'm kind of willing to bet that these two people are actually not real. They're, they're not clones or anything like that. This is simply part of a mantra that maybe he's in this, re, you know, this alternate reality where he's stuck with these two people. And no matter what he does, they just keep coming back. That's why there's so many clones of them, because he just can't get rid of them. And you can see how this is really starting to have an effect on him how he's really starting to lose it, and I'm very excited to see where they end up going that Jeremy Irons, I mean, he is just killing it in this role, and now that we have more of an idea of what's going on in that storyline, I'm that much more invested in where they're really going here, because suddenly this doesn't feel separate from the show, suddenly this does feel like we have a real connection here, and I'm excited to see where they really do end up going with all of that. We also do get to see more of what uh, Adrian is really trying to do here. I mean, clearly there's something going on with Mr. Phillips and Miss Crookshanks, and they're his way, I guess, of getting out of here because... He tries this thing where he puts this suit on uh, Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips ends up frozen solid, and you can see that Adrian's very upset about this. And uh, basically now he is going to contact someone known as the Game Maker. And I don't know if this is the, the Game Warden. I don't know if this is uh, Dr. Manhattan. I don't know if that's where that's really going. But I'm assuming that Game Warden means that maybe he is, in fact, in a simulation. And maybe he's not in a real place right now. This is just some sort of simulation he's in, in terms of his imprisonment. And he's clearly growing increasingly annoyed by this. And you can see that it's really starting to affect him in the way. So I'm really wondering where that's going to go moving forward. But I guess we'll have to see. But again, in terms of technical stuff, I mean, there was so much to love here. There's also that stunning shot where you see Lori in her apartment and there's that uh, poster of all of the old Watchmen and it really shows how she's kind of living in the past, you know, with her connection still to Dr. Manhattan, which we don't even know if that really, if he can really hear her, but she clearly does still have a connection there with her uh, clear affection for the Watchmen overall, her uh, having an owl that resembles Night Owl and her naming him who and things like that. I mean, you really do see how Lori Lori feels very alone in that way, and even though, yes, you have Petey, who does care about her, um, she herself is kind of trapped in the past, and you can see why she's grown very cynical and just very annoyed because of it, and I think the show did an excellent job with really showcasing that here. Once again, my dumbass uh, forgot to bring up just how great uh, the score was in this episode. I don't know what it is with me lately, but for some reason, whenever I do a TV review, I keep leaving out... Um, you know, how amazing the score was, but Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, I mean, it was on another level here. I love the score that played for Laurie. I think that it, uh, really was kind of a character of its own. It was very, um, again, similar to Laurie. It had this very sort of cynical, um, type tone to it, and I, I really did love it for sure. And I've been loving their score, but this was easily, uh, the best it's been, and, uh, I think definitely, um, def definitely anchored the episode quite well here. I really enjoyed that score a lot. Whether it was the brilliant scene um, where, you know, we're at the funeral and things like that, and there's about to be this, you know, um, attack by the 7th Calvary, but Lori ends up stopping it. Again, I think that's going to be very crucial. Anytime Lori finds herself in danger, she somehow finds a way to get out of it, and I think that is her real superpower. Even though, yes, Lori didn't technically have powers, I think that is her superpower. She's able to, you know, just, she's able to end chaos almost immediately, and I think that is something we're really going to see her use to her advantage, and it could potentially become a problem because, oh, she's just never going to be able to put herself in harm's way, but I do think that there is definitely more to it than that. I love the scene, and I think, again, it's it's just due to the fact that she knows a lot more um, than any of these other characters do because she's just done this for a lot longer. She's more used to, you know, what the Watchmen are doing and things like that, so this is not, nothing about this really phases her at all. Um, 
And again, so much great humor within this episode, just the dark humor when she's going on about, um, and, you know, uh, about, like I said, uh, the, um, you know, Hooded Justice being a vigilante, not a hero. She didn't really care about that. Or her telling Angela that Cal was um, really, you know, that she, Cal was really attractive and things like that. Her just being very blunt, I love. I love that Lori is very in your face. She doesn't hide anything. It's very different from the Silk Spectre that we saw in the 80s, but it makes sense considering what this character has in fact been through. And I think they did a really good job with that here for sure. And the show just really seems to understand and, you know, the Watchmen, you know, sort of, um, again, the Watchmen universe in that way. And that's the thing. Like, I heard people complain, oh, this isn't like Watchmen. I, I told you guys to wait. Just wait. They have something planned. They have something that is really going to be great. And that's very much the case here. We now see where things are going. We now see where this narrative is actually headed. There's a lot of potential here for sure. Um, and I'm excited to see where they really do end up going with that. You know, is Lori going to be able to take down Keen? Obviously, Keen wants to be president. He wants to do what he can to make sure things go in his favor. Um, but I don't think that he is sincere when he talks about the 7th Calvary, when he talks about how much he cares about the people. I don't think he really cares about that. I think that's all just for his own political gain. I think Lori sees through it, and I'm excited to see where that really does end up going. But she also clearly does see through Angela. She doesn't buy into her bullshit and all that kind of stuff. I think there's definitely more that's going to be going on there, and I think that it, Angela is going to very much fear Lori in that way. Now she's going to have to keep this more of a secret. She's really got to keep this under wraps, and I'm excited to see where that's really going to go. Uh, we also see how she's, you know, threatened Looking Glass and all that stuff. I mean, there was just so much great stuff going on in this episode, but also the confirmation of Osmandius. Now that we know that um, he is, in fact, the Lord of County Manor, uh, it just adds a whole extra dosage to where things can really go here because like I said I do think he's in some kind of alternate reality where he has to do the same thing essentially every single day and he can't deviate from that routine very much at all because oh it's going to hurt your imprisonment and things like that you know that's the terms of your imprisonment and I've heard a lot of people say that Dr. Manhattan might be the person that did imprison him and I think that very much could be the case here I think the fact that we have so much you know that they are very very much referencing Dr. Manhattan, but there's also so little known about him. Uh, I think we're definitely going to get more into that for sure. Overall, though, there was just so much to love about this episode. This was easily the strongest episode of the season, yet it gave us such a better understanding of what's really going on in the show, and really just a far more compelling narrative. I was already very interested in what was going on with Angela and things like that, but now I just cannot wait to see where the show is, is headed, because they, you know, introducing Lori, showing her, and also having Osman and also now having Osmandius, it just really heightens the stakes of the show and takes it to a whole new level that I didn't think it was going and makes me very excited to see where the show is going to go. And again, it just felt very Lindelofian in that way. The whole, the fact that most of this episode focused on Lori, the fact that a lot of it was her telling this joke to, um, Dr. Manhattan, you know, her loneliness, a lot of that just felt very much like something Lindelof would do, which I always really do appreciate. I love these single character focused episodes, and you know, despite the stuff we have with Osmandius, the whole thing really being in Laurie's perspective, I think was definitely the right move for sure. And overall, this was just such a fantastic episode, and I'm definitely going to give this episode of Watchmen, Season 1, Episode 3, She Was Killed by a Space Junk, overall in A. But overall, guys, in my review of this episode of Watchmen, let me know if you guys saw this episode overall, left your thoughts on it. We'll see you guys in my next video, and we'll see you guys for that. Okay, bye.